I love the prophet who struggled so hard When his mission was just a start He held the hands of each companion I'm ashamed to play with little children With little children I love the prophet who struggled so hard I love the prophet who struggled so hard. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to another episode in this beautiful series of How He Treated Them where we learn how did Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him treat every people around him whether friends or enemies, family members or even bad ones, rich or poor, young or old. And today, insha'Allah, we're going to learn about the grandchildren of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and we're going to learn how he treated them. This episode should be equally important to the other episode where we spoke about the children of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I'll tell you why, for a couple reasons. Number one, because we're going to learn about the grandchildren of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and their names, and it will be surprising to some that they didn't even know he had that many grandchildren who lived, who died, who married, who have children, etc. Um, secondly, learning how the Prophet وسلم, who was managing the affairs of this huge and great Ummah spare time to play with the grandchildren, to have fun with them, to carry them on his shoulder, even when he was leading the prayer. It's going to be very fascinating. I promise you, brothers and sisters. Bismillah, without any further ado, Sheikh Ibrahim. Name the grandchildren of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But how many were the first? They were seven. Okay. And of course, the very obvious, Al Hassan, Al Hussein. Yeah. And then after that, there is uh, Umm Kulthum. And. And uh, Zainab. Zainab. They were four from, from Fatima, Fatima and Ali radiallahu anhu. So we're going to say Al Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Al Hussein, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Umm Kulthum, the daughter of, of Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Zainab, the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And there is Uthman ibn Affan, there is Abdullah. And Abdullah uh, mm -hmm. was born from Ruqayya. Right. Right? And right. that was in Habasha, in Abyssinia. Right. And he also died when he was young, about right. six years old or so. Right. Okay. And there is Umama and uh, Ali. Then we're talking about Al As. Right. Abu Al As, right. Ibn Rabia who was married to Zainab radiyallahu right. anha. Right. Two children. Umama. A boy and a girl. Right. Umama is a girl. Umama right. is the name of a girl. And Ali. And Ali. Ali uh, died uh, during the life of the Prophet sallallahu right. but he was grown up. Right. And he's right? the one that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, when he shed tears yeah. when he was dying. And he said, this is rahmah. This is a mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put and in the hearts of the him. people. And he buried Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so Umama was the girl that she used to... Uh, run around in the masjid and I remember once uh, that the Prophet وسلم, picked her up mm. when he was praying <coughs> he was leading the prayer and he put her on his shoulder mm. he mm. was leading the prayer reciting and Umama was sitting <coughs> on his shoulder and then whenever he would bow down he would put her on the ground then he would stand up he would pick her up again and that did not nullify the prayer. And it became a ruling that we all follow. Subhanallah. Yeah, subhanallah. Such a, an uh, action, action of the Prophet ﷺ, the kindness of mm. the Prophet ﷺ mm. to his granddaughter become a ruling in our deen that if your child is going to be disturbed when you're in the salah, carry the child and it doesn't nullify yeah. the salah. I have a surprise for you, my dear viewers. We said Ali ibn Abi Talib had four children, obviously from Fatima, mm. radiallahu anha, right? Mm. Do you know that Umm Kulthum, the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib, mm -hmm. he gave her in marriage to whom? Yeah. To Umar ibn Khattab. To Umar ibn Khattab. And that was way after the Prophet وسلم, passed away. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? So that means uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased, with both of them were in perfect terms. Because why would I give my daughter wow. in marriage to exactly. somebody whom I don't like? And this is one of the things that people do not have an answer to this. Those who oppose the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Mm. If you tell them that Ali radiallahu anhu, he got his own daughter married to Umar radiallahu anhu. Mm. <laughs> they don't have an answer. 
Subhanallah. And you know, just following on to uh, Sheikh Ibrahim has said, I haven't said that for a little while, mm-hmm. that uh, many rulings are taken from the grandchildren mm-hmm. of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like mm-hmm. Umama, that is permitted to hold your child within Salah. Mm-hmm. And if you think about the things that we do with a newborn, mm-hmm. like Tahnik, which is the chewing of the date, mm-hmm. or the naming of... Uh, giving the good name. Giving the good name, of and course. And the aqiqa. All of these rulings. And Adhan. And Adhan. Yeah. And also the circumcision. All of these, and the du'as that you make, uh, for the children, w- many of them was regarding Al Hassan and Al Hussein. I'm going to go one after another with all what you just mentioned right now because this is very important as Sunan that the Prophet وسلم, actually did with his grandchildren. Mm-hmm. But before you go through them one after another, I wanted to share with the viewers another fact. Umama, that little girl whom you and I were talking about, the Prophet وسلم, was carrying her on his shoulder when he was leading the prayer. Was married to whom? Who mm. married Umama? Bint Zainab and Bint Abil Aas ibn Rabia. She got married to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Radiallahu mm. anhu. But after Fatima radiallahu anha died. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, it is forbidden to marry simultaneously two sisters or a girl and her aunt paternal or maternal. So when Fatima radiallahu anha died, uh, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib got married to Umama bint Zainab bint Abu al-As, which means, Mm. hey, when you think that your wife's nieces are mahram, they're not mahram. Mm. And Ali ibn Abi Talib was officially married to Umama, this little girl, may Allah be pleased with all of them. Now, Sheikh uh, Wasim, Mm. Can I say something before the the mention of the grandsons and daughters? Of course, this is a free episode. You can say whenever (laughs) you want to (laughs) say. These (laughs) these ahkam, the rulings that is going to be talked about, inshallah ta'ala, it shows the perfection of the deen because the own sons and daughters of the Prophet, many of them were before, or all of them was before, being sent as a messenger. So there was no narrations being uh, guarded and to be collected about these rulings. So that's why the grandsons and daughters of the Prophet, are essential part because they are like the sons and daughters of no. the Prophet. No. 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 That's right. Also draws us to something important here. The age difference and how they choose each other. It wasn't an issue, Sheikh Muhammad. It was not an issue. It wasn't an yes, issue. Not yeah. only among the Arab, among the Arab, among the Persians, among the Romans, and wallahi until very recent. Many Christian kings, they were in their 90s and they married young girls, 11, 12, 13. And wait a minute, it's in the Bible. Uh, you can tell us better about Joseph the Carpenter when they thought or this is what they say that he got married to Mary when she was 13 and he was above uh, 80. So the, the, uh, the, 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 the age. Success, successful marriages. Yeah. Also they chose how, how who is a spouse and who is that person. Mm. So you see that the, the relationship between them was, uh, w- was ideal exactly. Yeah. And mm. now back to how mm. did Prophet Muhammad mm. sallallahu alayhi wa sallam treat those grand children of his, how many we said? Seven. Seven. Mm. Four from Fatima and Ali. Mm. One from Uthman and Ruqayya. And he died when he was in Habasha, six and years old. And two from Zainab and Al-As. And two from Al-Aas. Zainab and Abu Al-As, her husband, yeah. who was actually her cousin as well. Yeah. Yalla, Sheikh. Bismillah. Yeah, so <coughs> when we call them grandchildren, uh, there's many occasions that the Prophet Sallallahu called them my sons. And this is the relationship mm. that, mm. you know, we have if you have grandchildren, you don't think that, okay, there's a, there's a skip in another generation, but essentially they are your flesh and blood from your chil- your own children, so essentially they are your children. Mm. And as we know that the Prophet, on a number of occasions, would you have called them my sons. You said, you said about either. those uh, prophetic traditions since birth, that the Prophet wasallam called Adhan in the ear of Al-Hasan, mm. right? Mm. What is the significance of calling Adhan in the ear of a newborn? So it is the sunnah that when the adh- a, a new baby is born, girl or boy, no difference between the two, that the first thing that they hear, inshallah ta'ala, is the kalimat al-tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. And just as, you know, the first thing that they hear mm. uh, when they are born is the kalimat of al-tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Dear viewers, by the way, it is a sunnah whenever you call in adhan for the prayer, 
to raise your voice, to make it out loud. But whenever you're calling Adan in the ear, <laughs> in the right ear of a newborn, you whisper, please. <laughs> okay, you do not <laughs> shout, no scream. <laughs> but even though it's a, I think it's a weak narration, but it's become, it became the way of the, yeah. the Muslimin and the yeah. statement of Omar yeah. yeah. Abdullah. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. The ulama have, well, established this is an, uh, you know, is an acceptable practice yeah. for, for us to do with our yeah. children. So then the technique. Tahnik, yeah, so there are many rulings, as I mentioned, concerning Al Hassan Wal Hussein in the, uh, the, the Prophet Sallallahu practice, in the chewing of a small amount of date, and putting on your finger, uh, I think specifically in the roof of the mouth, mm. which allow, encourages the baby to start, you know, sucking, and then obviously it will suck from its mother. So and basically, w when you chew on a, on a date, mm -hmm. uh, you wash your hands thoroughly, mm -hmm. and you wet your finger mm -hmm. with some of the juice of the date. Yeah. And then you pour it here within the gum, mm. so the it stimulates the taste buds and the child starts sucking on it. Yeah, that's right. It, it motivates the child to start sucking the blood, right? Uh, uh, sucking, well, suckling from the mother. Correct, yeah. afterward, yeah. because it stimulates the taste buds. That's right. Yeah. And also, there, there's some, I think, some medical benefits that uh, it said that some children, they have a low uh, sugar in sugar their blood. Correct. And, and it can help them uh, get some energy. the immunity system. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so a tahnik or the softening of the date. The good name. And also a good name. And al-hasan, meaning beautiful and nice. This was given All to... All the names that we, we went through, the seven yeah. grandchildren, the Prophet sallallahu named them. Mm. Beautiful names. And mm. this is something we should follow as well. Name mm. our children these names, that they can be... Uh, have a, a b have a proud feeling about you know these great names from Islamic history. May yeah. add something. Yeah, Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on him, said in this regard, <coughs> al asma'u yeah. So names are not just names; rather, they would reflect the meaning of the names upon the child in the different stages of his or her life, as children, as teenagers grown-up people as adults so if you give a, a child a good name it will accompany him and it will benefit him yeah. subhanallah yeah. so you also have the rulings of the aqiqah aqiqa. which is for a boy two sheep to be slaughtered and for a girl one sheep to be yeah. slaughtered and, and then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa did for al Hassan al Hussain again the grandchildren am yeah. two beautiful rams yeah. Uh, the, the shaving of the head as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this was mentioned again in the hadith of Al Hassan or Al Hussein. Mm -hmm. There is the circumcision. Yeah. Uh, again what do we do after we shave the head? Yeah, so it is practiced that uh, when the head is shaved, that it is weighed and its equivalent uh, in its weight with regards to silver is then given as a sadaqah, mm -hmm. uh, as a charity. So there are these ahkam to do with the brand new uh, mm -hmm. child. And Ibn al-Qayyim has a very famous book mm. about the rulings pertaining to the uh, new child, the newborn baby. Uh, one of the lady companions by the name Lubaba in Abil Harith um, was sitting and the Prophet ﷺ was carrying Al-Hasan. So he simply passed urine. They didn't have, uh, you know, diapers back then. So he passed urine on the lap of the Prophet ﷺ. She said, don't worry, O Prophet of Allah. I'll give you a different thab by the time I wash it off. He said, no, 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 no need. And he did something called nadh. Yeah. He sprinkled water yeah. over the place, which yeah. was solid. Then he removed it. Exactly. To, make, his to make it visible. Yeah. Uh, but it pays our attention to something good also. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ spent quality time with his grandchildren. This is it's very it's important. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad, you know, you, you're just pressing on something... Uh, um, I don't know what to say, but <laughs> it's mm. kind of problematic for us yeah. because uh, I guess all of us are lacking this quality, spending time with the family. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and no matter how much busy we are, no way that we are any way close to the busyness of Prophet Muhammad mm. where he spends time with his wives, nine wives at a time, where he spends time with his friends, with his daughters, and then with his granddaughters, subhanAllah, and, and he said quality time. It, it, we will talk about his quality time in playing, mm. but I would like to focus on education. Mm. We had two situations with Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein. The first situation is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to repeat it for him, and he was a child. 
the pro he said in the authentic hadith حَفِظْتُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, I memorized mm. from the Prophet وسلم, it's like and what you can epithet or what it is like a legal maxim it's mm. something uh, which is uh, to the point and concise mm. the Prophet وسلم, repeated it too much times to Al Hasan Al Hussein, to Al Hussein. Mm. and he said دَعْمَا يَرِيبُكَ إِلَى مَا لَا يَرِيبُكَ mm. The Prophet وسلم, addressed in his personality the point of how to be firm and how to be sure and how to be decisive and it became a system in the whole of his life and to keep off the him. doubtful matter exactly mm. and this is basically this is something which is uh, our young people are in need for this is very important he and he learned also the dua of al qunut uh, that's no, al hasan he narrated no, this hasan but sheikh ibrahim no. i have a question for you Imagine you have those beautiful great grandchildren, Al Hassan and Hussein. Very handsome. They are the, the, the children of Ali and Fatima. And the luckiest people on earth because they are Sibtai Rasulillah, the grandsons so. of Prophet Muhammad. I'm sure some people would give them an evil eye no. or envy them for whom they are, for being the grandchildren of the Prophet, for being very lucky. And envy, brothers and sisters, does not necessarily happen to, uh, does not necessarily have to be deliberate. Mm. It could happen by accident. Unlucky you guys. I wish I was like you. So the envy does not necessarily have to intend hurting or harming the person whom he envies or she envies. That's why the Prophet وسلم, used to recite Ruqya upon al Hassan wal Hussein on a regular basis. Mm. The Ruqya was We're going to learn after the break inshallah the meaning of these beautiful words of ta'weeth or seeking protection of Allah for the grandchildren of the Prophet from Sheikh Ibrahim. So stay tuned. We'll be back inshallah in a few minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Before the break, we shared with you that the Prophet sallallahu used to recite ta'weeth, recite supplications as means of protection against the evil eye and against uh, every kind of harm in order to protect his grandsons al Hassan wal Hussein. This hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas and it is collected by Imam Bukhari. So this is a serious matter. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do this very frequently until the last two chapters of the Quran were revealed. So he added them, I mean he used to recite them upon them as means of protection. When we read that brothers and sisters, we do not read just to get acquainted that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do this, but also to inspire us. Many of us, our kids are crying for no reason, having headache for no reason failing the exam for no reason. We did very well, but the outcome is bad. Ruqya, recite the following Ruqya upon them. And Sheikh Ibrahim is going to tell us the meaning of this beautiful means of ta'weed that the Prophet Sallallahu used to recite upon his two grandsons, Al-Hasan and Hussein. The dua is, U'idhukuma bi karimati Allahi tamma. U'idhukuma in the dual tense. Nista'adha is an act of worship that is to be done only to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. I seek refuge in Allah by the perfect words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the complete words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from أعيذكم بكلمات الله تامة من كل شيطان وهمة ومن كل عين لامة which means from every shaytan and hamma, hamma is the, the things that has poison and the snakes and the like of this and from any عين لامة, from any eye that is evil mm. that would cause harm by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. so seeking the protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against these things because the child 
does not have the ability to say this to himself mm. for his for his own self. Mm. So this is becomes part of the rights of the children that we, as we protect them from all kinds of physical harm, we protect them also from these things by these types of uh, and from the evil of the the sorcerers, those who mm. would uh, blow, the, blow the evil uh, soul in their in the knots. And from the evil of the e the, the, w the envious when he envy. Okay. So this is uh, to be said uh, to the children as the Prophet And said. also brothers and sisters, the Prophet sallallahu would frequently take his two beautiful grandsons Al-Hasan and Hussein to Al-Masjid. And Abu Bakr is another Sahabi different than Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa giving the khutbah on the pulpit and next to him was his grandson Al-Hasan, the beautiful grandson. Then he would look to the people once and then he would look at him another time. And then he said, Inna ibni hada sayyid, the son of mine, Al Hassan, my grandson, is a chieftain. Wa la alla Allah an yusliha bihi bayna ta'ifatayni azimatayni min al muslimin. This prophecy is miraculous. Because he said, the son of mine is going to be a master and a chieftain. And God willing, Allah will reconcile between two huge parties of the Muslim Ummah who will be having some sort of discord. Sheikh uh, Wasim. Um, we know that <coughs> uh, after the uh, assassination of Uthman ibn Affan, uh, عنه, that Ali ibn Abi Talib became the Khalifa. Mm. And also, there was an assassination of Ali ibn Abi Talib, mm. anhu, and there was, you know, some confusion at the in the Ummah at the mm. time, who was going to succeed and follow mm. uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And most of the people chose Al Hasan. And there was the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Al Hasan, mm. and his choosing of being the Khalifa was not actually for a very long time. Six months. Six months only. Mm. But there were some kind of some, uh, if you like, some still problems within uh, what had happened previous to that. Mm. And so Al Hassan, uh, radiallahu anhu, willingly actually stepped down. Willingly stepped down to allow peace mm. in the ummah. Mm. And as we know, that after that, that Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, became the Khalifa, and things, you know. And this is how he continued. reunited the ummah. Exactly. So one thing, uh, Sheikh Muhammad. The Prophet ﷺ said in this sound hadith that perhaps Allah will reconcile between two huge great factions of Muslims through my son Al Hassan. So a Nabi ﷺ described the two uh, parties, whether those who were following Ali radiallahu an, or those who were following Muawiyah radiallahu an, as two factions of Muslims. Muslims. This is an indication mm. of how to properly approach the conflict which occurred in the Muslim Ummah at that time. And we have the belief that mm. uh, everybody exerted his optimum effort in understanding reality. So everybody was a mujtahid. Uh, so we cannot actually condemn one or the other because all of them, inshallah, will be rewarded for this reason. This is the uh, intent of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They are both Muslims. Jazakallah and we should not so extend any... Yeah. Even well though there was yeah. a fitna, but the Prophet sallallahu yeah. alaihi described them as Muslims. And it's, it's actually in Surah Al-Hujurat, when Allah mm -hmm. the Almighty says, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ قَتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُ Discord may happen between two factions of Muslims, and they are still Muslims, and they are still believers. May Allah reconcile with all, between all uh, Muslims. I mean, uh, every time I read Surah at Taghabun, and I come across ayah number 15, in which Allah the Almighty says, أَلَمُوا أَنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً Right away, I remember the incident where uh, the Prophet وسلم, was giving the khutbah on the pulpit. And right in the middle of the khutbah, he saw his two grandsons, Al Hassan and Hussein, were wearing two red shirts, and they were kind of uh, tall and stumbling in them. So he interrupted his speech. He descended from the pulpit and he made his way all the way 
until he picked them up and then he carried them and he went back to the member, he ascended and he looked at the audience and said, Indeed, <laughs> This is a beautiful thing that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. It's very difficult to, to apply when a person look at himself as I'm going to be like, you know, taking myself from a position where I'm speaking to adults and do this, they might look at me as if I'm... <laughs> and the Prophet ﷺ set the best example, subhanAllah. subhanAllah. And it becomes something that we would talk about and people would learn the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ in his heart. And he is basically teaching the people how to be kind mm. uh, to, the, to the youngsters and how the Prophet ﷺ put it in the right perspective that they are fitna, that they are trial. Mm. They can take you away from what you're doing of a serious matter, but it doesn't mean that it's a sinful thing. It can take you to forgetfulness, so be careful. Yes, it's okay to take you away sometimes, but it not to make you, you know, fall into what's haram. And this is the balance where mm. the, the Prophet, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaching us. was not tested like other prophets with regard to his sons and daughters and grandchildren. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, he was That's tested Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with their death. With their death, no. exactly. But not with their iman. Mm -hmm. And that's why a righteous father, a righteous mother, the worst thing that you would do to them mm -hmm. is to have uh, non-righteous mm -hmm. children. That's yeah. worse than the physical harm, subhanAllah. Yeah. Uh, Sheikh Wasim, um, I remember once that the Prophet وسلم, also was leading the prayer and it took him so long in sujood to mm -hmm. the extent that the companion thought he passed away. No. So on many occasions we know that the Prophet وسلم, would bring his grandchildren to the masjid. And the Prophet ﷺ would at times go into sujood and that they would crawl on his back. I mean, for, for those who have, to have uh, small children, it's happened to us, I'm sure, on they more love than one that, occasion. No? So they love that. Oh, they love Once doing that. Yeah. Sujood, they learn very try. quickly <laughs> that when you're in salah that you don't do anything else. Right. They keep up their mischief and all types of things. Mm. Right. They learn very quickly. So at times the Prophet ﷺ would stay in sujood for so long. Mm. And he, al Hassan and Al-Husayn, would stay there. And then once he had had enough and got off, then he would continue with the salah until some of the Sahaba had questioned that Rasulullah, uh, some of the Sahaba actually looked up to find out, you know, what's going on. It's a really long sujood and we've <laughs> not experienced this before. Yeah. And uh, the Prophet uh, explained to the Sahaba different answers were given from them that I wanted him to have his satisfaction playing on my back and then get off. Allah and then we would continue this in the This is really amazing. He was having a good ride. Yeah. So he didn't want to disturb him. Subhanallah. This is amazing. Mm. You know, once I was leading the prayer in Ramadan, and somebody brought his child with him who was running between the rows. Oh my God, I don't want to tell you what happened. And it was a Ramadan. Big fight in the masjid. Where people objected, normally the elders, you know, why do you bring the kids to the masjid? Throw them away. You should not come to the masjid. And I remember myself when we were young and, you know, when the elders see us in the masjid, it's like, you know, we are some sort of <laughs> cockroaches. <laughs> and they will kick us out of the masjid. And we love the masjid. But in fact, this is entirely wrong because an Nabi Wasallam was and is our excellent pattern to follow. And if he did so, if he carried Umama on his shoulder when he was leading the prayer, if he interrupted his khutbah and came down all the way to carry Al-Hassan or Hussein, resume giving the khutbah while he's carrying them. If he sat Al-Hassan next to him when he was giving the khutbah and he was looking at him and addressing the Ummah. If the Prophet Sallallahu was leading the prayer and he was in sujood, and it took him so long to the extent that one of the companions lift his head to see if the Prophet is okay. And after the Salah, they said, Ya Rasulullah, one sajda, you took so long in sujood, we thought you passed away. He said, no, I didn't. My son was enjoying himself riding my back and I hated to interrupt him. We still have a long way to go. Yeah. And there was no way that we can achieve this without learning the biography, the lifestyle, of the Prophet Sallallahu and how he treated them, how he treated everyone, how he treated his companions, how he treated his enemies, how he treated the munafiqeen, how he treated the mushrikeen, how he treated nine wives at a time, and how he handled their jealousy, how he diffused every single problem peacefully without having to lift a finger. 
or to lay his hand on anyone. How he refused the problem before taking place and how even when the problem have taken place, how he was able to solve it peacefully without hurting the feeling of anyone. How he earned the love of his enemies, not only his companions. May the greatest peace and blessings be upon him. How he used to have fun with the kids and play with them to the extent that the bad ones enter upon him and he's cuddling and playing with the kids and kissing Al-Hassan wal Hussein. Then this guy Al-Akhra ibn Habis says, oh, you guys kiss your kids? You know, I have 10 kids. I've never kissed any of them. He said, what can I do for you if Allah has taken away the mercy from your heart? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-Hassan minni wa ana min Al-Hassan wal Hussein. من أحبهما فقد أحبني ومن أبغضهما فقد أبغضني These two grandsons of mine, they belong to me and I belong to them. Whoever loves them, then he loves me. And whoever hates them, he hates me. This is a sign of belief to love the Prophet and his household, his children, his grandchildren. Ali ibn Abi Talib and his children Fatima and her children. How could anyone claim that he loves Prophet Muhammad or he's even a Muslim and he does not like his household? How could anyone claim that he is a Muslim and he's having a problem with Aisha, whom the Prophet Sallallahu said, she's my dearest and my most beloved. When he was asked, whom do you love most? He said, Aisha. And then when he was asked of men, he said, her father, Abu Bakr. How could anyone say I'm a Muslim when he does not believe in the mothers of the believers and, they, and he says they are not my mothers? You're right. They are not your mothers because you're not one of the believers. When Allah the Almighty says in Surah Al-Ahzab, وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ And all the wives of the Messenger of Allah are the mothers, the mothers of the believers. If Aisha is not your mother, if Hafsa is not your mother, if Ummu Salama is not your mother, then you're not one of the believers. If you don't love Abu Bakr al-Siddiq equally to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, then I can assure you, you're not one of the Muslims, not just one of the believers. If you don't love those whom Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa loved, then you're not one of the Muslims. And if you're not willing to learn how to treat people the same way that the Prophet Sallallahu treated them with their servants, drivers, maids, friends, or even at the time of discord, how to treat your enemies and opponents, then you're not willing to take the Prophet Sallallahu as your role model and your best example to follow. The Almighty Allah, brothers and sisters, said in Surah Al-Ahzab, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Indeed, for you or who you believe, in the Messenger of Allah, you have the, the, the best and the greatest pattern the excellent example to follow. For those who truly believe in Allah and in the last day, and they hope to meet Allah the Almighty as believers, they hope to enter paradise. Your best choice is to follow the Prophet and to take him as your excellent example to follow. That's why brothers and sisters who have been meeting here for the past several days to share with you how Prophet Muhammad was and how he is indeed the greatest example to follow and how did he deal with everyone. Finally, brothers and sisters, in a few seconds I want to hear final conclusion from each one of the blessed shaykh because indeed we ran out of time and we need to wrap it up. Sheikh Ibrahim. Now, these blessings that we all heard throughout these episodes, if it wasn't from the Sunnah of the Prophet it's not just from the Quran. Mm. And it's for people to hold fast to the two, two sources of revelation from Allah, the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet and to continue to be steadfast upon them. 
This is the Libre. Sheikh Wasim, how did you feel about this uh, program, mm. this series, and this gathering? I mean, personally, uh, talking about <coughs> going through the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there was nothing more enjoyable uh, f for me personally. You know, we have the Quran, and uh, that is, of course, in in encompassed within this era. So this is something which, living, uh, once you start from the beginning and can come to the end. You want to do it again. So something like this is not the end for us. Having said so, Sheikh Muhammad, how would I you like to have another series in the same line? I wish actually to continue because there are a lot of things we did not cover. Uh, my feeling about it, subhanAllah, I had clearer vision of the Quran in reality. Allah More closeness to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his Allah actions, Allah. more love for him. Real love. Real love. Based on knowledge. Brothers yes. and sisters, I guess we owe you another series and another one. So next phase, inshallah, will be about men and women around the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, where we learn about the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more in depth and why the Almighty chose such people to be the greatest generation ever. Expect us soon with another series, insha'Allah azzajal. But in order to achieve that, your support is needed, your dua, your help, your support. May the Almighty Allah accept from all of us. I want to thank you so much, my dear guests and brothers and shiuch, Sheikh Ibrahim Zidan, Sheikh uh, Wasim, who came all the way from London, and Sheikh Mohammed Saeed, May Allah bless you all. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب لك. I want to pay special thanks and gratitude to the cast behind the cameras, to the preparations, to the workers, to the drivers, to everyone. A lot of people are working here on the set in order to make this program uh, this program easy for you to watch. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I love the prophet who struggled so hard When his mission was just a start He held the hands of each companion I'm shamed to play with little children With little children Amazing stories of someone who had morals Spoke gently, lifting compassion banners Never vacillated to say what's right His conviction in Islam was eternally bright